Welcome to Renegade Inc, the talk show which allows us to think differently. If you want to point to the historic moment that mainstream economists declared themselves bankrupt, it was in November 2008. Queen Elizabeth visited the London School of Economics and asked why no economist saw the financial crisis coming. The LSE professor was unable to answer her simple question, but did admit that at every stage someone was relying on someone else and everyone thought that they were doing the right thing. Since that exchange, the realisation has dawned on many that it's the discipline of economics itself that is the problem. And until economics is fixed, mainstream economists will continue to fly blind and we will continue to foot the bill. A quick glance around the world, and it's safe to say that the operating system that we've used to manage our economic and financial affairs has, well, a glitch or two in it. Huge wealth disparities, abject poverty for billions, environmental degradation, and financial crises that wipe out wealth with monotonous regularity. They're just a few of the downsides of our outdated economic thinking. Joining me to discuss how we got into this situation, and more importantly, how we get out of it, is the economist and author Kate Rayworth, who's recently written and published her book, Donut Economics, in which she calls for an economics reformation. Kate, welcome. Uh, seven ways to think like a 21st century economist. Your basic thesis is that this faulty or uh, outdated thinking uh, is not serving us. We've got to get rid of it and replace it with something else. Yeah. How did we get here? Well, the economics that's taught in universities today, I'm passionate about changing it because the students who come to university today are going to be the policymakers, the politicians, the business leaders, the journalists, lawyers, taking us through the 21st century. But the economics they're being taught comes out of the textbooks of 1950 which is based on the theories of 1850. And given the 21st century challenges that you just talked about, from climate change to financial crisis to extreme inequality, that's shaping up to be a disaster. So I wrote the book that I wish I could have read when I was an economics student wanting to change the world, when I believed that the, the mother tongue of public policy, economics, would equip me. What I discovered, though, is that these theories are so out of date with blind spots that economists barely even go back and look at the roots of where these ideas came from. And so economics has just become a self-fulfilling, complete theorem unto itself, which is taught as if it were the mantra to take up. It has to be questioned. We have to go back, examine those roots, see what was wrong with them. Economic theory, I think the caveats and the blind spots in it, have lain a very open space for a very powerful story to be built up, which is the narrative of neoliberalism, which began in the 1940s. And a small band of economists realized there was an opportunity to write a new narrative about what the economy was and what it was for. In April 1947, in a little Swiss village, a small band of economists met with plans to rewrite the global economic story. And they called it neoliberalism. Their method was ingenious. They described each economic actor with a set of such powerful traits that the rest of the script almost wrote itself. In the 1980s, when their laissez-faire story was finally put on the international stage, the plot was loaded from the very start. And so for the last 40 years, we've been told that the market is efficient, so give it free reign. That the state is incompetent, so don't let it meddle. That trade is win-win, so open your borders. That the commons are tragic, so sell them off. That society, well, there's no such thing, so ignore it. And that the household is domestic, so leave it to the women. With such a cast list, the triumph of the market seemed almost inevitable. And it's been driving us into social and ecological crisis. But we were also told that finance is infallible. And that was so clearly disproven in the global financial crash that it's called the rest of the story into question too. It's time to ditch this outdated neoliberal script. We need a new economic story that's fit for the 21st century, one that puts the economy in service to life. So how should that story begin? That is a story, we've been told. Uh, it hasn't kind of worked. What's the new story? So the new story is being written. And my realisation as I was writing my book is that the most powerful stories are those told with pictures. So we can't write a new story if we don't go back and change 
the pictures, the diagrams, the images that deeply slip into the back of our heads without us even realising they're there. But Give us an example of one of those. The biggest one, I would say, and I'll say to any economics professor, show me, show me the biggest picture you have of the economy. Like, what's the, what's the big picture? As in a pictorial definition. Yeah, of what's, what's the biggest model? What, what's the biggest thing you can put on the screen? Because you put lots of pictures up on the screen. What's the biggest thing you can show your students and say, here's the economy? What it is, is a diagram drawn by Paul Samuelson first in the 1940s. The classic diagram at the heart of macroeconomics is called the circular flow diagram. And what it shows is the market with the households and businesses. So households exchange their labor for wages and those wages they use for consumer spending to buy goods and services. So the money goes round and round and so do the, do the resources. So you've got this circular flow and Samuelson actually drew it first as a radiator system, like money flowing through pipes. He was teaching engineering students at MIT make it easy for them, right? They understand radiator systems. So it was money throwing, flowing through these closed pipes. But today, when we look at that, the blind spots of what it misses out are extraordinary. Give us some blind spots. It makes absolutely no mention of the living world. There's no point in that closed system where we see that energy and materials are drawn in all the time into the economy and spewed out as pollution and waste. It makes no mention of the unpaid caring work of parents, the cooking, washing, cleaning, sweeping, raising the kids, changing the nappies. All the important the, stuff. <laughs> all the important stuff that's central to well-being that makes that labour fresh and ready for work every day. Mm -hmm. Who made the labour fresh and ready for work every day? It's not mentioned. And it makes no mention of the commons, which we saw in the video. The, the idea of the commons, that's a place where people come together to make something that they value, whether it's a, a neighbourhood garden on the corner of their block or Wikipedia online. So if you're going to leave out the living world, the unpaid caring work of parents, and the organising of the commons, you're leaving out three of the most essential and dynamic sources of our well-being. It is not going to set you up well to understand the economy. And those blind spots have come back to hit us. Adam Smith said it's not from the benevolence of the brewer, the butcher and the baker that we get our dinner, but from their, their own interest. Well, Adam Smith was living back at home with his old mum when he was writing this book. So as he's writing away, guess who's making his dinner? It's his mum. He never even notices that, right? But if, he, if he'd only turned around and realised mum was making his dinner as he was writing these sentences, we might have seen the unpaid care economy get reflected in economics right from the beginning. So we've talked about the biggest diagram in economics. What about the first diagram in economics? What would you guess the first diagram anybody learns? Something terribly simplistic, which doesn't really reflect the real world. Probably something to do with equilibrium. Exactly, supply and demand. Let, let me just show you. I, I like to bring along a few host pipes with me. You take that end. This one. Yep, and that end. No. Okay, so let's make a supply and demand. All right, here we go. There we go. So that's so, the first diagram that students are taught. The demand curve slopes down, the supply curve copes up. There in the middle, that's equilibrium. So what happens at a magical place where, where X marks a spot? What happens there? This is where uh, the price that people are willing to pay meets the cost that it costs a producer to produce something. And so, what if, so what if we move this? What happens? Then this is, this is equilibrium. Then here. this is a new equilibrium. Now, the whole of, a lot of economic education is about moving these curves up and down. Right? It's actually based on Newtonian mechanics. What does that mean? So the economists who drew these curves in yep. the 1870s, they were looking to the physics of the day. They wanted to make economics like physics. And so they looked to Newton's theories and they would say, just as Newton came up with the physical laws of motion, we're going to come up with the economic laws of motion. And the idea of it being laws was important. So the laws of supply and demand, the law of diminishing marginal returns, just give me those back, because the beginnings of this idea that economics could be like a law, I think this has been one of the most powerful and pernicious effects in economics. Once economists realised they wanted to show that eco economics is a science, is reputable as physics, once they got data, they began to look for the equivalent economic laws of motion. There are no economic laws of design. That, that original idea to be and like... that's your point, is it? That, yes. that actually, that these laws have been, have been exactly the things that have put us off the trail. Yes, that it was that search to be like physics. And the physics of the day was Newton, and Newton's was mechanics, and he discovered the laws. So economists wanted to be discovering the laws of motion. So it's been like, we, we are going to uncover the laws of how economies work. It's a false goal. Physics envy. F it's physics envy, it absolutely is. We with a, with to... a load of maths. Oh, show it all in maths, because then it makes it really serious science, right? <laughs> and this to me is the other fundamental shift, not just recognizing that economy exists within the living world, but that economists need to stop trying to be like engineers and physicists finding these laws and need to become systems thinkers. 
and realised that the economy is in a complex, ever-evolving adaptive system, and therefore the art is to figure out how to intervene in that system to tweak it and nudge it into the direction we want. If that's the art, how do we start practising the art? Give us some pointers of how you start systems thinking. At the essence of systems thinking is realising that we, the world, whether it's your family relationships or the boom and bust of stock markets or the rise of the 1% or the collapse of ecosystems, these patterns, their dynamics, are best understood through what's called systems thinking. Let me give you a simple example, right? right. See this little bird? I do. Okay. What is it? This is a starling. The way starlings fly, when they get together in a flock, they have a very particular relationship to each other. They'll stay about a wingspan apart from each other, and when the other birds around them turn, they turn. Now, put that little rule together and bring 100,000 of these birds together at sunset, you get what's called a murmuration. It's an extraordinary pattern that starlings make in the sky, totally emergent property of the behavior of 100,000 of these little birds all following the same rule. And you see it waving and moving and pulsing. Well, I love to go and watch murmurations and I look at that and I think, that looks a bit like the stock market. Why? Because each bird is responding to another bird. So it's about investors' expectations. Everyone thinks the market's gonna rise so everybody keeps investing until it bursts and then the whole swarm of birds pulse down and pulse up. So it's about dynamic processes that are never in equilibrium like those hose pipes. They're constantly pulsing and moving. And then a system thinker needs to realize that that's what the economy is like. It's constantly pulsing and moving and ever adapting. So the question is not, how do I pull on the levers of supply and demand and make those laws work? The question is, how do we intervene like stewards, like garden designers, shaping and working with this evolving system. Economists typically think the way to intervene is by changing the prices. Actually, Donella Meadows, who's one of the leading systems thinkers and thinks about intervening, says, no, 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 this is a low leverage point. You want to go up, actually. Higher up, the higher leverage point, and high near the top is changing the goal of what the system is for. In the yeah. 1970s, the business of business is business, and everyone said, well, obviously. When you change that, and you say, actually, the business of business is to make a difference in the world. Well, now you're talking about purpose. And if, if business, if people going into business or setting up enterprises actually believe that, it has massive knock-on effects for the structure of how I create business, how I finance it. Because when you change the goal, everything else ripples down around it. Which is an absolutely perfect place to leave the first half. How should this economic garden be designed? We're going to come back, come back and, and talk to you about it in the second half. Kate, thank you. That's it for this half. Uh, more from Kate Rayworth after this short break. Welcome back to Renegade Inc, the show that allows us to think differently. Before we talk more with the author and renegade economist Kate Rayworth, let's have a look at our favourite tweets in this week's Renegade Inc index. First up is from Andy Whiteman on way home, met three members of the Scottish Parliament on their way to a sustainable aviation dinner. Lobbying register can't come soon enough. Sustainable aviation dinner? <laughs> yeah, uh, it seems like they want free lunch as well as dinner. Next up, we've got a tweet from Yanis Varoufakis. Uh, Europe has become a continent where numbers prosper and people suffer, a place where denial rules over reality. Next up, we've got a quote from Wendy Carlin, tweeted by Rethinking Economics. Uh, we impose a curriculum that is increasingly remote from the pressing problems that drew our students to economics in the first place. Time for a rethink. This is your central argument. Yeah, that's very close to my experience. Uh, and it took me 25 years to realise that having rejected economics, I couldn't actually walk away because it shapes the world we live in. That's why I walk back. Finally, we have another quote from Rethinking Economics, this time from Joan Robinson. The purpose of studying economics is not to acquire a set of ready-made answers to economic questions, but to learn how to avoid being deceived by economists. Here's to you, Mrs. Robinson, uh, as in she's right, is she not? Our book of the week this week uh, has to be Donut Economics by a woman called Kate Rayworth. I don't know if you heard about it, it's a really good book. Um, uh, pitch it. This is the book that I believe will equip any first uh, newcomer to economics, but not just a student, any person who actually is involved in the living world. And guess what? That's all of us. I think we all need to be economists. We all need to understand that the ideas that have been peddled to us and that our worlds are ruled by are centuries out of date, and we need to leap into the 21st century, the mindset that's worthy of the times. So these are the seven key ideas that I think 
give us even half a chance of meeting the needs of all within the means of the planet. We talk about the economic garden and you say that we should all be economists now. How then do you start thinking about this garden idea? How do we start thinking about the uh, economy as a garden and that we're here as stewards as opposed to uh, exploiting this? So if we think of the economy, uh, markets and communities, the government interacting, constantly evolving, then we are all shaping that in our actions, not just as what we buy and sell, but where we bank, how we vote, how we protest, how we volunteer. That's why I think we're all economists. We are all shaping this household. And in the 20th century, the, the, the pursuit of growth was put at the heart of economic policymaking. That needs to be dislodged. It's a cuckoo in the nest and needs to be pushed out. Why is it a cuckoo in the nest? Because of the uh, environmental degradation? Well, I think economics actually tried to define itself as a science because it wanted to be this, you know, like a science. Yeah. So it took away values. But when you take values away, you leave an empty nest. And what cuckoos do is spot that empty nest where they can lay their eggs and another bird will raise their young. And I think that's exactly what happened. When economics was defined in the 1930s as a value-free science, and this was an achievement, just around the time that Simon Kuznets was first asked by Congress to come up with a measure of national income and show how it had increased year on year. A single number to measure progress. And it's this slipping into the nest that had been left empty. So we need to escape that false cuckoo goal of GDP growth and replace it with two values that are actually worthy of our times. What are they? As designers, what are we trying to design this garden to be? I think there are two. It's amazing that you use the word designers because you're thinking creatively about this as opposed to uh, like an economist, which is as economists, we've got to do this as designers. As economic designers, I think there are two principles that should be guiding us in the 21st century. The first is to make economies that are far more distributive. Simple example, a company that's owned by its workers, not by shareholders. So the value goes to those who did the work rather than those who never even step over the threshold and extract maximum returns. Uh, you could put ideas not under intellectual patent, but under the creative commons. Distributive design, it's already happening. It's, it's emerging in the world around us. But also, secondly, regenerative design. What does that mean? Well, let me give an example. A hose pipe comes in handy again, yeah. right? So the, the 20th century industrial economy was linear and degenerative, right? We would take Earth's materials, some energy, stuff it in the pipe and go through the production system. When we make things that we want, we use them for a while, and then we just throw away the waste and the pollution at the end. We need to turn that around into a cyclical economy. Right. So that all waste from one process becomes food from the next. There is no such thing as waste. Nature knows no waste. So we need to create industrial processes that work within the living systems of the world, right. that work with the carbon cycle, with the water, nitrogen cycle, rather than endlessly degenerating the living systems on which we depend. But it needs to be put together with distributive design. Let me give an example, right? At the moment, some companies are saying, yes, we want to be circular by design. So let's say, you know, you have a smartphone. Yes. At the moment, all the take the raw materials, you make a smartphone, we use it for a while, and then it gets thrown on some horrible e-waste. So the company says, let's close the loop, send us back your phone, and we'll make it into a new one. So there you are, there's, there's a smartphone for you. So you, what's you be this? A this, is, this is a mobile this phone This is a mobile company. phone company, and they're making... And they're making them here. All the old ones are coming back. Send them back to us, we'll collect them, we'll remake them and into new phones. And then we'll sell them phones. again. So That's, there's nothing wrong with that, is there? Of itself, it's a good attempt to begin to create a circular economy. But then there's another mobile phone provider says, oh, but you know, we, we've got our phones over here, and you send those back to us, and we will turn those into new mobile. So we're, we've got the beginning of the circular economy. Now, imagine every company from tractors to laptops to phones to clothing saying, send us back the materials and we'll make them. The average Western consumer owns over 10,000 products. We are not going to be sending 10,000 things back to so 10,000. <laughs> you're going to have a th tens of th millions of these yes. loops. If nature looked at us, nature would laugh because nature doesn't do this. The cherry tree doesn't become a new cherry tree, the ivy, a new ivy. Nature works in networks. So that is the dangerous version of circular economy we want. This is what we want. We want an economy that is a distributed network, right? right? So all processes are interlinked. The, the resources, the materials from one process can be used by another. To make this happen, and this is how nature works, you need open source design so that whoever a mobile phone ends up with can read what those materials are, and you need open source systems that they can feed the materials back into a process. This puts a lot of importance in the development of open source design and in modular design so that things can be taken apart and the parts reused. And the job of today's economists yeah. is to figure out what kind of 
finance systems, what kind of regulation, industry and government support is needed to make that happen. Because the designers can already do it, but finance isn't aligned, government regulation isn't aligned. So business design isn't aligned. So we, you know, being an economist now is a question of design and it's an incredibly exciting job. How do you design those institutions to make this possible? Pop that one down. Why donut economics? It's not about these, okay? Don't eat these things. Well, because they're, they're know, not, in America, it's going to be I know, really you know, badly translated, this book. They're not good for you. But I want to show you the one donut that actually could turn out to be good for us. It is shaped like this, like a donut. So in the hole in the middle of the donut is a place where people are falling short on life's essentials. They don't have enough food, water, healthcare, education. We want to get everybody out of the donut's hole and into the donut, donut itself. But we cannot overshoot the outer limits of the donut because there we put so much pressure on our planet, we cause climate change, a hole in the ozone layer, ocean acidification. So it's a balancing point between the two. And again, it, ridiculous though a donut is, the shape is the point. The shape of that donut is the point. The 20th century was dominated by one very powerful shape, which is the ever rising line of growth. And it's embedded in our language. Growth is put forward by politicians as a word that is just self-justifying, as if when I tell you the economy is growing, that's good enough. Actually, the metaphor, the image and the shape we need in our mind is a shape of balance, right. meeting the needs of all within the means of the planet. We need to rebalance between those, find the balance of regenerative and distributive design, and how do we create an economy that achieves that? So it's a very fundamental metaphor shift. You end the book by talking about learning to land. What does learning to land mean? Because we, we've understood now the limits of economic growth. I think we agree, and a lot of people watching this will agree, yeah, we need to get away from this narrative. How do you learn to land, and what does that mean? So when I went back, again, trying to root out the metaphors and the images at the heart of the economics that I'd been taught and that our countries are ruled by, the metaphor that underlines growth was actually written into a book in 1960 uh, called The Stages of Economic Growth. A man called W.W. W. Rostow, who was just about to be an advisor to John F. Kennedy, the presidential candidate, he wrote this book and the metaphor he put there, my favourite last toy, was of an aeroplane ride, right? So he said... By the way, this is Air Force One, this is, this appropriately. Is United States of America, absolutely. He said the stages of growth in an economy are like an airplane ride. First, there's traditional society, and it's just on the ground, nothing's happening. Then there's the preconditions for takeoff. You get the beginnings of a banking industry, industrial sectors, education for work. Uh, the people need to be touched with a certain nationalism and belief that growth is good for something beyond itself, like a better life for the children. Then you get takeoff, where growth becomes the normal condition and the march of compound interest can bear its blessings. Wow, are these his words? These are his words. Then you get the drive to maturity. When this you is all the American dream. This is it? it. You get the drive to maturity when you can have any industry you want, whatever your resource base. And the fifth and final stage yeah is the era of high mass consumption. I've heard this before. <laughs> are, yeah, are we here? it's familiar. Well, we're here. See, Rostow wrote this, the fifth and final stage in 1960, the era of high mass consumption. Well, you can hear it that this airplane ride is unlike any other because it can never be allowed to land. He's literally left us flying off into the sunset of mass consumerism. He knew that himself in his book, he says. And then the question beyond where history offers us only fragments, what to do when the increase in real income itself loses its charm. But he never answers his question because it was 1960, he was working for Kennedy. Kennedy was standing for election on a promise of a 5% growth rate. So Rostow's job was to keep that plane flying, not to ask if and how it would ever be allowed to land. So in my book, I playfully bring him back. I say, if Rostow was here with us on the plane today, perhaps he too would admit it might be time to land. What would it look like to allow this craft to actually stop always rising in growth, but actually have GDP become a response variable, hop out of it and onto a skateboard or a kite surf so that we can move up and down with a regenerative and distributive economy. Our economies, as he described, have become addicted financially, politically and socially to unending GDP growth. So how do we unhook those institutional hook-ins? This is the challenge. It's not good enough just to say, we're going to redefine the metric of success because the addiction to financial growth is written into financial markets. It's written into, no, into, into politics. No government wants to lose their place in the G20 family photo. It's written into society because thanks to a century of consumerism, mm. we've been convinced that 
we transform ourselves when we buy something more. How do we unhook these? Yeah. I've had a go. If you've done it, um, congratulations. Thanks for all the toys as well, because you know, visualizing this stuff is key because they're the narratives that we tell ourselves. Congratulations on Donut Economics. Thank you for, I know you're madly busy. Thank you for swinging by My and spending your time. Uh, we really recommend it and we think you should get a copy. Kate, thank you. Thank you. That's it from Renegade Inc. HQ this week. You can drop the team a mail, studio at renegadeinc.com or tweet us at Renegade Inc. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Join us next week for more insight from those people who are thinking differently. But until then, stay curious. Hold up. 